Okay, if you're seeing the same thing I am seeing, you should be seeing astrology and Kabbalah, etc. Now, first thing I want to note here is that may not be a spelling of Kabbalah you're used to. Is that a fair statement? Some of you may be aware of the spelling, but this is actually the best transliteration of the Hebrew. Because the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew word, is the Hebrew equivalent of Q-B-L-H. And this word is just the same with vowels filled in. Whether they're right vowels or not, I personally don't know, but I suspect they are. Because as you may know, uh, Old Hebrew has no indications of vowels. Modern Hebrew does, thank God. Okay, so there it is. The word is derived from the triliteral QBL, Kof Bet Lamed, which has to do with receiving. Some have therefore translated it as tradition, or what has been handed down, which is what tradition actually means, by the way. Uh, a word, I think, let me just see what the next slide is. Yeah, okay. A word about triliterals means three letter combinations. The Semitic languages are unique in being organized around three consonant combinations. <clears throat> and depending on what vowel sounds you attach to them, or in some cases what prefixes or suffixes you attach to them, you get different words that are all related. So, uh, for example, the, word, the Hebrew word for book, with one set of vowels means a book, with another set of vowels means a bookstore, with another set of vowels means a library, and so forth. This hap so one of the things this does is it makes Semitic languages the premier vehicle for making plays on words. Because with a little sleight of hand, you can ask the question, okay, which one of these meanings does it mean? And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, I used to have a standing joke that Genesis was written by James Joyce in a previous incarnation. <laughs> because Genesis is full of plays on words. Um, let me give you one example. You remember when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden? Like it was yesterday. They were, they, they, <laughs> what? I not personally, no. <laughs> I, gee, I hope not. Well, maybe actually I hope so, because <laughs> it could be very useful information. Uh, but you remember the passage where Adam and Eve are expelled from the Bible, okay? We're all now on the same page. Well, the passage says uh, they enclose themselves in coats of skin. The Hebrew isn't actually clear whether they enclose themselves in coats of skin or they enclose themselves in skin. Now, what's the difference? The first one sounds like they made a set of clothing. The second one indicates that they took on physical bodies and were not previously physical entities as we know them. And again, which does it mean? The answer is yes. <laughs> Similarly, the word for Sabbath in Hebrew, uh, Shabbat in uh, Ashkenazi, I mean in Sephardic Hebrew approximately at least, uh, means both rest and seven. So when they say, and on the seventh day he rested, there they go again. Uh, and this peculiar characteristic of Hebrew enabled people beginning in the, uh, in the early centuries CE, and most especially in the Middle Ages, to completely reinterpret the Bible by taking all these puns, if plays on words, that's a better term, seriously, and coming up with a completely alternate set of meanings for Genesis. Because, you know, quite frankly, Genesis is a little hard to swallow for a sophisticated, educated person. And people came to the conclusion very rapidly that Genesis was written in a popular way as a blind, to use the occult term, but those who really had the key could understand the esoteric meaning, and that process led to the Kabbalah. Uh, another little thing, by the way, any word in Hebrew ending in A-H, the accent is on the last syllable. Okay? So it's not Kabbalah, it's Kabbalah. Um, 
Uh, what I'm going to be doing today is talking about a number of remarkable correlations between the Kabbalah, um, Neoplatonism, and astrology. Uh, I'm not sure this is going to revolutionize your understanding of astrology, but maybe it just might, because this is a reinforcement for me at least, it's reinforcement for something I've been maintaining for a long time, which is all of the planets are both malefic and benefic, or neither, depending on your point of view. It all depends on how you use them. And this doctrine is very explicitly stated in an early transitional work called the Sefer Yetzirah, uh, which means the Book of Formation. By the way, the tri there's, a tri there's the triliteral for book. It's S. FR using Latin letters, the Hebrew equivalent of SFR. And any SFR word means something relating to books. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your fondness or plays on words, uh, other SFR combinations have to do with numbers and uh, things of that sort. So you get all kinds of amazing plays on words. The Sefer Yetzirah is not generally recognized by scholars as being part of the Kabbalistic tradition. Yet, the Sefer Yetzirah was very important to Kabbalists. So I think we have to say that um, uh, in terms of historical cause and effect, it is part of the Kabbalistic tradition. Nobody knows how this work came into existence it kind of crystallizes out of nowhere in somewhere between the 2nd and 6th century A.D. or C.E. And it's a description of one of the, one of the forms of creation that occurs uh, in the Bible. Um, you may, be, you may uh, be a, not be aware of it, but there are, in fact, several creation stories in the Bible, two of which are, look like they're part, but they're part of one two of which look like they're uh, a part of one whole, but actually, from the Kabbalistic point of view, they're two separate ones. Um, and the whole thing, there are three, actually, including that one. And here again, we get some very interesting correlations. We're going to be calling in Pythagoreanism, Platonism, uh, at various periods, uh, uh, Jewish thought. It's really quite amazing. And we come into the point where you have to ask yourself, just what was the Cosmic Coincidence Control Center doing? Or was it not coincidence? As a result of the Jewish uh, religion created one of the most sophisticated branches of the perennial philosophy to be found anywhere in the world, and I'm particularly interested in it, not because it's Western, because it has one unique quality. Are you ready for this? That the universe will culminate with uh, Malkut, which is right here, where we are now, which is uh, dominated by the feminine aspect of God. And yes, there is one called the Shekinah. The Shekinah will rise up into the tree, filling up the hole called Da'at, which means knowledge, right there next to Tiferet, beauty, Tiferet is the bridegroom, she is the bride. The two will lock in sexual embrace and the universe will become an enlightened being. This is Kabbalistic. Uh, it, that gives it something peculiar because as a Western doctrine, it's, it's different from the Eastern ones in that it believes that there is something going on here that has a destination. That's very Hebraic. It's also very Western in general. Uh, the only thing is, as I said the other day, you have to measure this process in billions of years rather than dozens of generations. And we may or may not be part of it, uh, depending on whether we get our act together or not. Okay. Now, just to refresh your memory from previous, uh, we have the Neoplatonic worldview, which postulates the one about which nothing can be said except that it is prior to all else and as the source and archetype of oneness, life, and consciousness. Or as I prefer to add now, so, since I did this slide in the first place, the only thing you can definitely say about the one is that there is no two. 
um, the sec it, it generates out of itself, or more precisely within itself, um, a process by which uh, basically, uh, have you ever sat down and said, well, what is this with me? You're thinking about yourself, right? Yeah. Are there two entities there? No. Well, in both Hinduism and Platonism, essentially, putting it in a very oversimplified form, the ultimate source of all being starts thinking about itself. And because the thinking is a process that is created. It is not co-equal with the one or the source. And where the one is simultaneously everything that ever could be, ever will be, ever, will be, ever was, undifferentiated and, un, and unseparate, Noos has to look at it one piece at a time, so to speak. But the, there's no time, of course. But um, the, it is a dimension that corresponds to time. And oddly enough, the Sefer Yetzirah tells us which dimension. The Sefer Yetzirah, uh, you know, isn't a blatantly platonic work, but all these people were thinking along similar lines, and whether they intended to or not, they started reinforcing each other. And this is the heritage, by the way, that the church blew. But fortunately, the Jews, not being Christians, got to keep right on going. Um, the only problem is that at one point in the early modern period, um, there was a false prophet who was deeply into the Kabbalah, and he discredited the whole thing because he was clearly a phony. Because when they started putting the pressure on him, he converted to Islam. Zabtai Zevi, do I have the name right, Lise? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Noose, in turn, is that which knows, and its, frame, its space is the space of eternity. And in that space comes knowing and being, same and different stasis and, and change. And it produces the same thing, it does the same thing the one did, and produces psyche, which is the aliveness of the world, the principle of life. And psyche, turning around to contemplate noose, generates nature. So this is all a contemplation of the higher levels of divinity. And that's why even in Neoplatonic terms, although I don't think too many of them drew this conclusion, the Jews did, the Platonists didn't, that if it's contemplating the higher levels, then it must be evolving toward them. Platonists were a bit anti-cosmic, to use the technical term. That is, they were not entirely sure the physical universe was okay. Although they weren't radically Gnostic, they did not believe definitely that it wasn't either. They just were kind of uneasy about the whole thing. Okay, that's not... Oh, yes, that's right. Okay. So, again, a, a slide I had shown earlier. We have the... Okay, that's not the way it's supposed to be, but all right. Hypostasis. We have the level of the hypostasis, which is soul, noose, and the one... We have the cosmic level and we have objects of knowledge. Well, this, I, w I won't belabor this any further because we have a lot of stuff to go through here. In the human being, however, our oneness is the fact that we are not divisible, which is what the word individual actually means, indivisible. You cut a person in half and you do not have two people. <laughs> you don't even have one. Um, that, that is what I call an integrity, or a, you can also call it a holon, if you like, or a holistic system. All of these concepts are similar. Then the level of noose is reflected in our ability to be conscious, not in what we know, but that we know. And soul indicates planets in the cosmos and the psyche in action. And the psyche in action reflects the movements of the planets in soul because we are in soul. Okay. And finally, the body rep is, corresponds to the sublunary realm. The body of the universe corresponds to the sublunary realm and the physical body. I've gone through this already before. Now, here's something, here's something new. There is one major difference between the Kabbalah and... Platinian Neoplatonism. For Platinian Neoplatonism, the one is absolutely it. 
in Judaism or Kabbalism, there are three levels beyond the one. And this would seem to imply that something new had come into being, and that's partly true and partly not. Uh, Proclus, who was one of the later Neoplatonists, had elaborated considerably on Plotinus' ideas, and he had a one beyond the one, and he would have been perfectly happy to divide it into three. In Kabbalah, it's the ayan, the ayan sof, and the ayan sof aur, which means, uh, let's see now, unlimited, no, it means, um, yeah, unlimited, undefined, the unlimited light, excuse me, the un, yeah, the un, unlimited light is the last one, I've forgotten, the, oh, nothing, yes, nothing. <laughs> nothing, the unlimited, and the unlimited light, that's what the three terms mean. And this is interesting because, uh, well, time for my dreaded pocket comb metaphor. I've used this a lot. Here's a pocket comb. You got your glasses on, you can see it, even in this slightly dark environment. This pocket comb exists because of two simultaneously true facts. One, there is a pocket comb here. Two, where, there, where this pocket comb is not, there is not a pocket comb. Now that sounds stupid until you realize that if the essence of pocket comb filled all of the universe, there would be no pocket comb. Because for the pocket comb to exist, there has to be not pocket comb. Mm -hmm. Well, the ion is that state of apparent nothingness in which everything fills everything. And then it begins to generate, uh, it, it begins to go from a nothing to a fullness. A pleroma, it would be called in Greek, that's the ion sof. And finally, the unlimited light is what happens as this operates, and at that point we can say, let the proceedings commence. Let there be light was the first thing God said, and that was the ion sof hour. Except um, to a Kabbalist, it's not quite clear that that was the highest level of divinity speaking, but the correlation is interesting. So, this, these, this level is, in both systems, the uncreated. They're not really, it's not Ein creates, Ein Sof creates, Ein Sof Aur. There are three different aspects of looking at the same thing. <coughs> Dare I say, a trinity. Uh, <laughs> except it's nothing like the Christian one. The created begins with a manifest one, which corresponds to Plotinus as one. In Hebrew, it is called the level of absolute not absolute, absolute, and it's the emanational realm. Then we have nous, or it's also called the archetypal realm. Then we have nous, which corresponds to beria, which is the first of two levels of creation. Uh, in beria, that which is not needed is carved away so that you have um, something versus nothing. Now, that, you can see, has a similar tendency toward polarity that we found in Nus. Psyche, or soul, corresponds to Yetzirah, which is formation, and the book of Sefer Yetzirah is about the creation of this level of the universe. Then, finally, we get dear old cosmos, which is called Asiya, which means action, and, oh, by the way, it appears to be the same word, same word as proxis, which is the same word as karma. It's what you do. It's what hap It's what you what you do, and what happens as a result. I can't think of a clearer definition of karma. Now, was it like people were sending caravans back to India to get the latest hot poop on Indian philosophy, <laughs> or reverse with the Indian setting, sending caravans to the West to get the latest poop on Western philosophy? Uh, the caravans were definitely happening, but there's no evidence that either side was aware of what the other side was doing which is impressive as hell, because that means they were seeing the same thing independently, and that is the definition in most people's minds of what is real. So, the Sefer Yetzirah, and that uh, Hebrew below it is Sefer Yetzirah with the vowel markings, and everything I'm going to be quoting from the Sefer Yetzirah until I run out of the slideshow uh, is from... Um, um, Mera Epstein's new translation, forthcoming, published by us. It's a radically, not radically, but it's a significantly different 
translation of the Sefer Yetzirah. I mean, it's not violating the tradition, but she's done some things which nobody has thought of doing before. Uh, and she's presented, she presents it in the book in a way that will make it really easy for people to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, and there's not much commentary, but there's a pretty hefty introduction. So, the, this is, I'm going to call this, even though it's historically questionable, the early foundation of the Kabbalah. It's usually described as being part of an intermediate mysticism called the Merkaba mysticism, or the um, chariot, the, the method of the chariot. Sefer Yetzirah is the earliest of the foundational texts of the Kabbalah. Whether it really was the beginning of the Kabbalah depends on what you mean by beginning. It was composed between the 2nd and 6th centuries CE, and here is an interesting thing. According to Arya Kaplan, Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation, which is still in print, it contains much material concerning an esoteric astrology. And notice that the Yetzirah is the third word, world, the world of soul, containing only three elements, as we will see. This is the description of the world of psyche in which the material world is embedded. Um, more on that. Now, here is something truly weird. The triangle on the left is called the Tetractus, and it's usually associated with Pythagoreanism, and it's the arrangement of ten. It is coincidentally also the arrangement of bowling pins, <laughs> but that's, that is because the geometry of 10 lends itself to being displayed in this manner. I would not consider that your bowling activities have anything to do with esotericism necessarily. <laughs> so you'll notice that absolute is, is associated with oneness, because it, after all, the uh, corresponds to the Neoplatonic one, and its element is fire. Fire generates air and produces beria, which is the first process of creation. It is in beria that the pocket comb stops filling the universe completely and becomes an isolated pocket comb. Uh, more on that. Yetzirah is, instead of being a carving process, it's more like a molding process because water is the next element. Earth does not arrive until Asiya, which is right here, as I mentioned before. And um, uh, <clears throat> that's the four, a realm of four elements. So what this is showing is that there were at least three creations prior to the creation of this world. But it isn't like they were in succession. It's like fire is ontologically first, fire, air, second, fire, air, water, third, fire, air, earth, water, fourth. I want to alert you to something. The Golden Dawn in its studies of Kabbalah have, have, the, have um, water as being very ah, and air is coming in. It, well, let's see here, how do I do this exactly? Um, yes, okay. If you talk about only the new element. They have fire coming in at Yetzirah and water coming in at Beriah. Now, what's going on here? They give fair warning. If you've ever read Golden Dawn material carefully, they give you fair warning. There are mistakes intentionally introduced into the material because they figure that if you're really going to learn this stuff, you've got to learn to recognize the mistakes as mistakes. They're called blinds. Any of you familiar with that term? Yeah. This is one of those blinds, I'm sure of it, because the Kabbalistic literature is absolutely emphatic on what I've got here. So in other words, to get past the boo-boo in the, in the Golden Dawn, you're supposed to go to the original material and check it out. You're not supposed to take the authority of the Golden Dawn person for it, because he is intentionally misleading you so that you will do independent inquiry. It's a rather interesting didactic device. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it. As, as, a, as a practicing scholar, I kind of prefer that people tell the truth because the truth is often difficult enough without people intentionally buggering it. 
Okay, now we're about to run out of the first group of slides. Uh, actually, no, we have quite a bit. So I will skip over this one for, no, I can't. Um, yeah, I don't want to do this. Um, okay, I will do the first letters of Hebrew alphabet, and then we'll switch slides, <laughs> and then we'll come back to this. The first letter of the, okay, the, letter of, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as they are written, um, as they were written from the early centuries, uh, late centuries, uh, BCE into the present time, appears in the left-hand column under the word letter. Some of the letters have two forms. Oops. Um, that's not right. Okay, but at any rate, um, this is the product of some considerable haste, so there are going to be mistakes. Um, Aleph... And there is the spelling of Aleph in Hebrew, is ox. Now, if you ever see a picture of the old Paleo-Semitic Aleph, it looks exactly like a Taurus leaning at a 45 degree angle. <coughs> exactly like a Taurus. And many people have opined that this indicates that the Semitic alphabet is far older than most people realize because to start off the alphabet with an ox suggests that that was the first constellation of the zodiac where the vernal equinox is located at the time, which would make it somewhere, in the somewhere between 1000 and 2000 BCE. And that's quite a bit older than most people are, well, maybe not so much. But it suggests an, a very approximate date for the birth of the, uh, of the alphabet, because the Hebrew alphabet is a variation on the Phoenician alphabet, which is part of a group of alphabets that are called Paleo-Semitic. Uh, we had a weird experience in our spiritualist group. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Aleph rules air. <laughs> so from this moment forward, be prepared for weird coincidences. <laughs> rumble, rumble, rumble. Uh, Lise, was it, was, it, was it one of the people in the group, or was it, some, uh, it was a kid who came to the group, right, who showed drawings that he'd done? Where are you, Lise? Yes, I'm over here. Okay. He's a high school student. High school student. And Lise looked at it, She's more than a bit of a student of early Hebrew writing. She said, God, that looks like Paleo-Semitic. Paleo Unfortunately, we never got a chance to really check it out, but it really looked like Paleo-Semitic. And this, remember, was a spiritualist church <laughs> in which anything can happen and does. Okay. And then the letters follow bet, which means house, or bayit. Well, actually, bayit is the Hebrew word for house, but bet is the second letter of the alphabet. The names of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet are not quite Hebrew. They're Old Semitic, of which Hebrew is a later dialect. <coughs> so again, we're getting a clear indication this is way older than you might think. Third letter is Gimel, corresponding to um, uh, the letter G and C. It's both of them, because in the original Roman alphabet, C can be pronounced either K or G. Like, um, Gaius, Gaius Julius Caesar uh, spelled his name C.J. That is, his, his, by the way, Romans used initials. He was C.J. Caesar, but his first name was Gaius. That's because of that pronunciation of the C.G. I have to tell you a story about Gam Gimel while I'm stopping here. There is a passage in the New Testament which reads... A rich man, for a rich man to get into heaven is like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. Remember that line? Yes. Well, there is a school of thought that believes that the Bible, the New Testament was either written in Aramaic or I would say more likely they were thinking in Aramaic because the word camel, from which, which is descended from the word gimel, I think you can see, is also the name of a kind of rope that was used for tying up tents for making tents, rather the, the you sewed together the fabric with gimel. And to do this, you had to cut off all the frayed ends on the gimel so it would pass through the eye of a needle. 
So the, the passage properly understood doesn't mean that rich men can't get to heaven. What they have to do is get rid of all the distractions that are preventing them, the frayed ends of the tent rope. Uh, I am convinced that uh, Aramaic, Aramaic style thinking is all over the New Testament, except possibly in Paul. He was thoroughly uh, a Grecophone. I don't even know if he could speak Hebrew. So forth. We won't go through the whole thing. And the next slide would have been the rest of the alphabet for the moment. Let's just let it be. <laughs> There's the next slide. You can see that it's in a somewhat primitive state. Uh, <laughs> now, here we have some passages from the Sefer Yetzirah, Mishnah 1. In 32 mysterious or mystical or wondrous, these are different translations, paths of wisdom. This again is Mary Epstein's translation. Engraved uh, yod he yod he vav he we do not say that name, of hosts of heaven, God of Israel, living God and king of the world, El Shaddai, merciful and forbearing, high and exalted, dwelling in eternity, and whose name is holy, lofty, holy is, and holy is he, and created his world with three books, in book, in number, and in speech. These are all S SFR words. There's the pun going again. Uh, you know the English word cipher? Mm. Wasn't originally spelled with a C. That is a, a form of the word meaning number. Arabic form to be exact, but Arabic does triliterals too. Same triliterals in fact. Um, let me give you an example. In Hebrew, the word for house of wisdom would be bayit chokmah. In Arabic, it's bit hikmah. Kind of close, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Which gives the current relationships between the Jews and, and the Arabs uh, <coughs> a kind of irony because they're really very close ethnically. After all, they have all a very similar religious ideas. Um, except Judaism is a little bit more about being about people and a little bit less about who succeeded whom. Mishnah 2, Mishnah 2, 10 sephirot blima, that's a word that's untranslatable, so she didn't. Sometimes it's spelled belima, but nobody really knows what the hell it means. And 22 foundation letters. So we have 10 sephirot, which are, we will see later what they became. At this point, we don't know what the word means, but number is probably close. Um, and if you'll notice, the OT is a plural. That's SFR again. Now, here's the point that I want to make. This creation, unlike the creation in Genesis, well, not actually unlike the creation in Genesis, but it makes it more obvious, is not, as uh, Alan Watts would put it about what happens later on, the ceramic model of creation where the potter takes the clay and, make, and molds it into a human and then breathes life into it. Um, here, and in the early part, earlier part of the Old Testament of Genesis, it's being spoken. You remember a quotation I gave a few days ago from Sir James Jean? More and more the universe is beginning to look like, more like a giant thought than a machine. This is, in fact, a creation of the universe by logos, by word, <coughs> by speech, etc. So, we have 12 sephirot, or sephirot, the pronunciation it seems to be a little variable, and 22 letters. The Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters.